Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to uh, our third and last session of Comics More Than Words. Um, so our uh, topic for this quarter was computer science. And um, today we're gonna have a very beautiful conversation on comics, computer science, and more, I will say. Um, so we have uh, a conversation with Zach Weinersmith, um, creator of SNBC, uh, and among many, many other books that, that we will talk about. Uh, and uh, we have also Chris Brick, who's a lecturer at the computer uh, science department. Um, uh, like the first computer science class that I took, I, I took it with Chris Craig. <laughs> yeah, so it was not long time ago, it was like three years ago, but it was next. Nice. So uh, I will let Chris to introduce Zach and, and, and let it go. Great, thank you, Christian. Uh, well, it is my pleasure to introduce Zach Wienersmith, the creator of the incredible webcomic SMBC, the instigator of the Festival of Bad Ad Hoc <laughs> Hypotheses, otherwise known as BaFest, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to ask him a little bit about that, and author and co-author of a number of wonderful books, including uh, a, a book I love called Soonish, which is uh, about emerging technologies that are at once both amazing and terrifying. Uh, he has also written some fun children's science books, and uh, he's just about to release a book, and then, as I understand it, another book, uh, but he's just about to release a book called Beowulf, two words, as, in, as it turns out, uh, which is uh, a retelling of Beowulf, and uh, we hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that from Zach uh, as well. Uh, Zach has an English degree from Pitzer College and also studied just down the road at San Jose State, where he delved into some biochemistry and then physics. And, you know, his comics often provide, uh, I would say, biting commentary and also very humorous biting commentary on popular science, technology, computing, mathematics. Uh, and, and he has uh, very humorously lambasted academics more than a few times. Uh, Zach has also worked in the film industry. Uh, he is married and his wife is actually a co-author. We may hear a little bit about that as well. And they have a couple of kids. So I look forward to, uh, to today's chat. Um, Zach has a few remarks um, and Zach, take as much time as you want. I might jump in with some questions here and yeah. there. And then we should have plenty of time for questions from uh, other attendees as well. So Zach, over to you. Yeah, thank you. That was that was a lovely introduction. Um, uh, I also do a lot of stupid jokes uh, in addition to all the, the smart sounding stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I guess um, for your class, I wanted to talk about a little about sort of how my career got started and uh, how it's gone and and the weird directions it's taking now. Um, so I, uh, as you said, I, I used to work in the film business. Right, right out of college, I uh, decided to forego a graduate degree in English literature and go to Hollywood. And um, I ended up uh, sort of climbing the ladder there. And I got to where I was an assistant to talent agents, which is kind of the job you want. But it was so utterly, utterly immiserating um, uh, that I, I fled the city to never return. And um, that's when I went I went back to university for a degree in um, at first biochemistry. And then I got interested in, in pure physics. And, um, and essentially, uh, I was doing comics on the side to help support uh, that uh, the, the physics lifestyle I wanted to indulge in. And uh, at some point they got popular enough that I kind of couldn't do both. And so I figured I would do comics and, and just teach myself stuff on the side and not worry about taking tests. So, um, so and, and then my career has basically blossomed since then. Um, the comics have gotten generally more popular over time, although the, the modern internet has made it very hard to measure that. Uh, so I don't actually know anymore, uh, but I, I, it, people seem to still read and, and buy books and things. Um, and then in the last, I guess, five years, I've gotten more into book writing. I released like comic collections, but not, um, you know, books that I'd written just to be books on their own. And so, as you mentioned, I wrote a book with my wife, Kelly, who's an ecologist, uh, about emerging technology, just because it was fun. Uh, and then, um, I, uh, I, uh, slightly more controversially, I, I illustrate a comic book advocating for an open immigration policy for the United States. Um, and then, uh, which which was uh, surprisingly popular, that was hard to get media coverage for it. Um, but, and then uh, COVID happened. Oh, and you mentioned, I do a thing called the Festival of Bad Ad Hoc Hypotheses, which um, COVID 
destroyed because it involved putting a thousand people in a room for a fun show together, which was like the worst thing possible. Can I, and by the way, our last show, the keynote speaker did a joke presentation predicting an incoming pandemic, uh, which was just uh, kind of astonishing. Um, and uh, so if we ever come back, that's the first thing that's going to be brought up. Uh, it's, it's our fault. Um, and uh, then uh, after that, I, I've kind of been branching out more. Uh, so as you mentioned, I, I have a kid's book coming out literally in, um, oh, I think on the 21st. So uh, the, the, like two weeks. That's crazy. Wow. Um, so yeah, I have a kid's book, which is a retelling of Beowulf for kids, which I just thought nobody would want to read. Uh, but I was, I was very happy to have made it and are, are we so far, I mean, it's not out yet. So maybe everyone will hate it when it comes out, but the reviews have been sort of extravagant and our sales have been much better than expected. So again, there's a hidden audience for old English literature for children. Um, and then I have one more book and I can't say much about it other than that it's about space settlement. I'm sort of embargoed from saying much more about that, but I have strong opinions on space settlement. Uh, um, so maybe maybe uh, so some other time uh, I could come back to discuss that. But um, but uh, I guess that's that's where I am. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, it's I I uh, I actually looked at your book on uh, space settlement. Um, it's always been my my thought that that one of the best jobs for an urban designer would be go to Mars and design like from a blank slate because you can't do that on Earth very much anymore. Um, so I'm sorry that sorry to hear you can't talk too much more about that, but uh, we will have to, have to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I could say I could say the one, one thing I think I could say without ruining anything is that I think you want to be real careful with the idea that there are any blank slates available in space because even uh, uh, I'm sorry, don't let me go on a tangent because then I'll start saying stuff I don't want to say. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, well, I have I have a couple questions for you that, that may uh, steer the conversation a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of your. I do want to hear more about Beowulf. First of all, yeah. why don't I ask that first? What can you? What can you tell us about Beowulf? Give us your pitch about about uh, the book. How how did you end up making this? Like going back and making this story now, you know, newly told. Yeah. So so the first thing about um, I, I say Beowulf, but about half people say Beowulf, and I'm just rolling with it because uh, it's it's. I think if you knew someone whose name was Beatrice and you had whatever her nickname was, is what you say. So uh, either way, it's cool. Um, Fair enough. We'll go with Beowulf. Uh, so so. It's a little weird, and, and what people should know, the weirdest thing about this book is it's actually written in verse, uh, and not like modern verse that is recognizable. It's like, so, so old English verse is written uh, in alliteration with a certain sort of style, and it, I'm not exactly copying that because it's hard to do in modern English. Uh, you know, old English is, is like, you, it's not a language you can read because you know English, um, and uh, so it's, it's fairly different, and it has different grammatical rules. Anyway, it's a really weird book, uh, and what happened was, is as you say, I'm, I'm an English literature major. Uh, I, I've actually read many of these these old books, uh, and so Beowulf's part of my working knowledge. And I have a daughter who's very smart, but doesn't usually listen to me. And I was in the car; I would drive her to school every morning. And I just, I swear, she would ask me a question, and I'd start to answer, and she'd ignore me. I could not get through to her. And then, for, as a joke, I started telling her Beowulf like for kids. Uh, which you know ended up being so. so if you don't know Beowulf. The, the 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 basic opening plot is that there's this really nice place. Everyone gets together, and then there's a monster who sort of ruins it by coming by and killing everyone, or most of the people, not everyone. Uh, and turns out that's a very appealing premise for children, as long as you remove the um, the murder part and <laughs> uh, like the the sort of like we had a good thing going and somebody ruined it is a very deep thing for children. And um, and she was just totally enthralled, which was the, like. The first time that had ever happened for me with her. So I just kind of kept going day after day until the story built up. And then, so I had this poem and it's like 600 lines of unrhymed verse. So I was like, nobody will buy this. Uh, so I uh, approached a friend of mine who goes by Boulet. He's a French artist. He's one of the best cartoonists in France. And France has probably the deepest comic book tradition, uh, which is something we could talk about if we wanted to, but, but um, you know, and and he was into it. And so we, we pitched it and by crazy dumb luck, because it was a very hard book to pitch. My last editor, the editor for that book about immigration had done her senior thesis on making Beowulf into a comic book. Hmm. And so we ended up working with her. It was just this series of coincidences. And, uh, you know, for people who, I, I don't know how much your, 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 your uh, classroom cares about like the ins and outs of publishing, but like, 
just getting an editor to like it doesn't mean you get to make a book. They have to go back to like a sales department and argue with them. And uh, I think I think I don't know the inside story, but I think she took some risks on our behalf, and it's it's ended up quite good. Um, That's yeah. great. Well, well, good luck with the good luck with it coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, I think you, you have a pretty good track record so far. So that's uh, that might be why the editors are, are able to pitch it so well. I hope so. Um, and uh, two, two, two different cartoonists as well. So that uh, that sounds. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. I didn't illustrate this one. So it looks really good. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's great. Um, that uh, uh, so my, my next question is is more about your. Uh, it's more about your comics. Your comics often feature you, <laughs> actually. <laughs> a lot of your comics, I go, oh, there's Zach again, like as part, as one of the characters in your comics and your wife, I might add. Um, and, uh, you know, it, indeed, the, you know, the featuring both of you, uh, in fact, today's, today's panel, I think, features <laughs> both of you, as it turns out. Uh, but how, how does, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about working with your wife and, and how that, like, how has that panned out? Um, number yeah. one, number two, how does she feel about being in all your comics, <laughs> all your comics? Um, and, and number three, uh, just, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how you work together and what kind of brainstorming you do together and that sort yeah. of thing? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. That, that's, um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I got asked that a lot with Soonish, and I never had a good response. But I feel like I have a better response now since we worked on this latest book. So, like, for, you know, I mean, so like we get along well and communicate reasonably well. So there's no like throwing a chair through a window. I, I don't have any drama to report. Um, but like, um, so for Soonish, which was a, a fairly easy research project, it was we kind of just divided and conquered. Um, you know, it was, it was like we had ten different topics, and so you know, one of us would would read the relevant literature. We, we had a little bit of division of labor. She did more interviews and stuff, um, but but it was mostly divide and conquer. And by the way, you know, it was cute is that we would go do talks and I everybody assumed that she had done all the hard stuff because she has a PhD and I don't, which it was it was like, like uh, we, 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 we got like reverse sexism uh, and uh, and it was kind of charming. I don't know. I was like, oh, this is, this is what it feels like to have someone assume you didn't do any work. Um, and, uh, but um, for this latest book, the one I can't talk much about, was it was a much bigger research project. So it's, just, it's a book about space settlement and we're covering just a huge amount of angles on it. Um, and so it was so extravagant, like the reason our bibliography is like a brick. It's just like endless reading. And so uh, what, what emerged is it turns out when you have that much work to do, you, you have to get a little more tactical. And it, it turned out that, so we joke like I can read a lot faster than her with 90% comprehension, but she reads slower with 100% comprehension, which is actually a pretty good combo. Uh, it turns out with a research group because I could I was able to like kind of read ahead and, and figure out possible directions, but then like there's a part where you have to make sure you're not full of it, uh, and that's where you need someone like Kelly to 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 be like, well, well, what is the what is the strongest version of the argument we're disagreeing with, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, and are we really representing this position properly and and uh, do you have a citation? She also, because she's a scientist, she would go through and like, anytime I said anything where, that sounded like an always statement, she was like, we're gonna change this to most of the time to the best of our knowledge, you know? Um, but we, we had a very good research relationship. Um, for the comics, actually, you know what's funny is I don't know, I don't even know she's in, knows if she's in today's comic because she reads my scripts. She's my like script reader and she like approves my jokes. So she never actually reads my comics. Um, so I, I'll i have to break the news to her. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I mean, I assume it's her. The 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 yes, have, yeah. you know, I, I assume it's her. <laughs> um, that's uh, yeah. That that's. I didn't realize she she was integral to helping uh, you know proofread et cetera your comics. That's that's great. Oh yeah, she helps out I, with that. I, I, absolutely. I, I I'm I'm very into feedback. A lot of uh, artists are like anti feedback, but I, I feel like it's it's very dangerous to get no feedback. You end up getting really really weird. Uh, and uh, a little, I, mean, I was just reading an interview with P.G. Wodehouse uh, from the 70s, and he was talking about how he loves reading critics of his books. And I was like, I've never heard that out of any writer. And he was like, well, yeah, there's this guy who said my last book was really bad and I stereotyped the characters too much. So I'll just fix that. Thanks, that guy. I was like, this is the most even keeled human being who ever lived. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. great. That's great. So, so Zach, one of the things 
Uh, one of the things I love about your comics uh, is certainly the pop science and mathematics yeah. and computing. And uh, of course, I also love the Batman, Superman rivalry ones, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, the, you, you went back to school to, to get, you know, to, to kind of feed a, an urge to learn more science. Yeah. And you must have walked in and said, wow, you know, th this is where a lot of my ideas are going to come from now because yeah. things in science are weird and things in science are, are you know pe people have different opinions and so forth um yeah. you know i think the you know that's what's endearing about a lot of your work is the you know some of it people don't you know some of it i assume people might be seeing for the first time as well yeah. some of these concepts and they go look it up and go oh wow uh you know do you have any examples of sometimes where, where you say uh this is almost a little too esoteric but i'm going with it anyway yeah, I, I I definitely do. I my my view has become like I update seven days a week, so I feel like I have a decent amount of latitude to just get go weird. And if it just if it just dies and nobody likes it, I I can just move on. Uh, but so, I don't know. Sometimes you get surprised. I did a comic. This wasn't even that long ago. This was maybe like six months ago. I uh, came up with this idea for a game called Incomplete Information Tic Tac Toe, uh, and it was just this. Um, without getting really boring, it was just like you randomize uh, whether each player is trying to win, lose, or tie, and each player doesn't know what the other player is trying to do. And it was just kind of a joke. And it turned out to be like surprisingly mathematically rich uh, in, in ways where I like, I, I, there was a guy who did a bunch of work on it that it was definitely, I didn't have the math to understand what he was arguing for other than like the, the, there were certain, stra like weirdly you'd think there would be a dominant strategy that would be obvious because it's, it's, it's just a variant on tic-tac-toe, but it turns out the, the lack of information you know, requires you to assume certain things. And I think ultimately they just had to simulate it and kind of see what happens. Um, and so I don't know, the, the thing is like, uh, you, know, it, you know, there's some areas that have been really plumbed. Like if you really, if you want to say something that nobody's heard about cosmology, I think that's probably pretty tough because like, you know, there've been 83 TV shows and every physicist who ever lived has written a book about it. Um, but like computer science is actually, I, I feel like an underappreciated area. Um, like, I don't know why, why are there like 8 trillion books about like Einstein and there's like four about Alan Turing. That's kind of changing, but not that much. But you're like, you know, if you want to talk about significance to modern life, you know, I, I think that you, there's a pretty good argument that we should be talking more about like, uh, you know, I don't know, like, uh, you know, the, the, all those early, well, we, we talked about Bertrand Russell, but like, uh, I'm blanking on a couple of the other guys who were involved early on, but. Um, there's definitely no, there's definitely a few out there. You know, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately, not every scientist and famous famous mathematician is Richard Feynman in the sense of being able yeah. to, you know, the story tells itself or they tell their own story. I think that's uh, that might be yeah. might be part of it. Um, back to your comment about uh, about that 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 game idea. Well, number yeah. one, have you thought about creating a board game? That might be <laughs> that's next. Um, you you have done some Kickstarter things before, correct? Yeah. Is that? Yeah, we, we actually have a board game that's finally almost going to deliver. It, it ended up being a much harder project than, than we thought. It's it actually interesting from a research perspective because, like, we decided to do a trivia game. And, um, you know, uh, the, you, usually when you're a guy who entertains, you just license stuff. And But we, we decided to be very hands-on. We're like, we have to write the trivia ourselves because we don't want, like, unsourced, unsighted, you know, like, we have we have a problem with, like, you know, we're being nerds, you know, you just want it to be accurate. And it just turns out it was, it was a really strange experience because we, we um, like, you start saying, well, I'll just write a bunch of trivia. Like, can I pull from lists? And it actually turns out a lot of like trivia that gets passed around is just wrong. Or it's like, I was, I, we were, there's a whole bad lecture you could do on this about how like a lot of trivia is not only wrong, like it couldn't even be right. Like you'll, you'll, there's a lot of trivia that's like, did you know that this animal does this? And it's like, it, you, you don't hear like enough specifics to, to even know like how you would look up whether that's true or not. And um, so this thing we thought would be easy ended up like being really hard um, and uh, partially because we made it hard, but also just because like it, it's actually hard to find out things that are sort of true and interesting and which can be sort of like stated in a single sentence. Uh, so yeah, that was that was a weird direction. Uh, I have like a long rant about how like all listicles are wrong um we, we actually like we tried to look up like in, in desperation like oh, give me a listicle of interesting science and i would say something like 70 percent of facts that you see them in a listicle are either either like straight wrong 
are misrepresented or couldn't even be right because they don't contain enough enough specificity to uh, to be right or wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, that uh, that that does sound sound like a challenge. I imagine uh, I imagine the creators of Jeopardy face the same sorts of things every day, where they they go, yeah. "Is this real or not?" I don't know if these are. Yeah, very interesting. It's it's, it's hard. I remember um, there's this quote unquote fact you'll see it all over the internet, and it must there's, there must be a year at which it burst onto the internet because after a certain point, it's just everywhere. And the fact is. The claim fact is something like ostrich eyes are bigger than ostrich brains. And you're just like, as a, like, you know, you just hear that and you're like, oh, neat. And then you, when you're like, well, I need to find a source for that. Then it gets weird because you're like, well, wait a minute. I like, there are multiple species of ostrich and like, what's your source? And I, I actually found a paper and it's actually more like they're about the same size. I've had like a paper where they were like, we dissected 10 ostrich heads. And, and so the problem is like, if you're if you're being honest, the actual trivia question would have to be something like, according to this paper from 2015 on on the on these particular ten ostrich heads, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, this is like a nerd problem. Normal people could answer that trivia question and just be happy, but uh, when you're a nerd, it has to be right. But at the same time, wouldn't you love it if you were at some some uh, some convention and somebody came up and was so pedantic <laughs> about it and was like, when well, that trivia question, it could be, you know. That, <laughs> I think that there, there's probably something about that 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 uh, would be fun as well. I have to say. Um, yeah, which, well, I see. This is the problem with entertaining nerds. I was, I was. Well, I won't say who I was talking to about this. But I was talking to a, a, a popular science author about why it's tough because, like, um, uh, like when you, I mean, I, I'm guilty of this, so I can't complain about people doing it to me. But like, where people will like, you know, one, you know, nerds want everything to be right. So if you were slightly wrong, they will correct you, and not always politely, but also they will be mad if you didn't mention their particular thing. So if you talk about nuclear reactors and you don't talk about their favorite thorium reactor design, you it's like as if you completely whiffed. Uh, yeah. So like you feel this extra pressure to not be wrong. Yeah. I can tell you, I can tell you, uh, professors and instructors face, face that just about every day as well. <laughs> yeah, the same. Yeah, sort of. it's tough. Yeah, yeah. and then it's, especially when like when you commit it to a book, then it's like it's you you're permanently wrong if you get anything wrong and. Uh, Right. Uh, right. Yeah. The I I the this is this kind kind of goes back to your your comment about the 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 challenging nature of that of that mathematics you came up with. Um, you know, the the creators of Futurama and The Simpsons put all sorts of jokes and mathematical and sciencey kind of jokes very much hidden for people who weren't paying attention. But those who were paying attention, it's a gold mine. And of course, there's a lot, there's books yeah. written about that as well. Um, and and I think. St your comics are a little different in the the punch you know the punchline very much is that but uh, but I can I can see that sort of same in fact I think they actually had a proof that came out of Futurama at some point I, I think I remember that yeah literal math proof but um, yeah so uh, so yeah I look forward to seeing more as much more pop science as you can in the comics I think that's uh, a lot of people would be would be yeah I, I I'm I'm trying to sort of read like so for for years I've worked on the space settlement book and I like I think I did some space settlement jokes but there's just only so much you can say and a lot of it had to go into the book and I'm now sort of re-engaging I actually like you know the thing I wanted to do is dig into computer science more for a while um because uh, like I said I feel like it's just an untapped mine of jokes there's just like there's not enough jokes about Frega you know it's it's time uh <laughs> could be very much very much could be um <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the things you had mentioned you might want to might want to talk about was uh, uh, growing your core business. So you have a, you have your fingers in a lot of pots right now, right? right. Or at least you you have over the years. Um, yeah. How did that? You know, was it was it just a matter of you had an idea and you tried to go find somewhere? Yeah. To, or what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like, um, my view is, and this is probably always true, but like. Basically, if you're trying to make a career on the internet, the internet dra changes drastically like every five years. And I had actually thought, what's been interesting lately is like, I remember I, I used to be like, okay, you have to learn a new platform every two years. That's just the deal. And then maybe starting 10 years ago, it kind of solidified a little. It was like, well, no, now it's going to be like Facebook and like Reddit and Twitter for a while. And that it, it, it seems to have fragmented more. Um, mm -hmm. So now what's interesting you see I'm trying to figure out how to adapt to this or to what extent I want to adapt to this is like, you could, if you talk to an artist who's starting out, who's like 20, they will tell you, okay, you can follow me at the following places. And they'll literally have like 12 different platforms they're on. Uh, they, they, and not just that they're on, that they've had to learn like 
like everything from what do what people on this platform want? What is the algorithm one? How often to post? Like, you know, even stuff like, well, if you're posting on Instagram, you have to cut up your comics a certain way and use a certain font size, which like, I, 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 I go back and forth on So on the one hand, I find it like kind of distressing because it's like, oh God, I wish all this time could just be going into craft and not into kind of, you know, guessing what the algorithm wants this week, you know? Um, I, I find it, I find it frankly, a really, really distressing that there are like research papers written on Facebook's algorithm. Like, like somebody actually, you know, spent all this time analyzing something where like there is an algorithm known somewhere. Uh, and then we're just trying to spy on it. Like, like this, just this time a human being could have spent doing something else. On the other hand, it's like, you know, I don't know, just the internet changes and you have, you have to roll with it. Uh, and, and it's, 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 it's good and bad. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I would say I have broadly negative feelings about um, about the way like like um, a lot of these big platforms have become run, where where it, it it's um, like 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 the the way you know every cartoonist over a certain age just wishes it never changed from RSS, right? Like oh. RSS was 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 perfect for for and and like so obviously perfect as an artist, but I think it was also fairly good for consumers because it was just like you sign up to get something and you get the something and you don't have to. Uh, get it based on whether other people like it too. Um, and so now lately, and this is maybe the next thing, oddly enough, is you start seeing everybody's got a newsletter now. Everyone's got like a Substack or a medium newsletter, right. which is which is a kind of, we like, I, I think of it as like bad RSS. It's just like, you know, it's, it's like it's RSS, but you have to sign up at 83 different places. Um, and so um, I'm sorry, this has ended up being a rant about the modern internet. So like in terms of my business, my view of it is the like, you know, the safe thing you do with a stock portfolio is you try to have diversity. Um, so if one thing's going bad, something else can be going good. And hopefully overall things over time go well. And so I, I have tried to, you know, I do my daily comic, which is still my main source of revenue. But but over time, I've shifted more and more to um, to books being a big part of right, my uh, revenue stream. And for a while, actually, you know, doing, doing BaFest was, was, was okay. It was never a big money maker, but it was like, you know, if you can get a thousand people together to do something fun, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's good for business. It was also just really fun. Um, I'm, I'm, we're, we're kind of eyeing what to do now that I don't want to say COVID is over, but like now that you don't, you wouldn't feel like a murderer if you've got a thousand people in a room together. Um, so we're, we're kind of figuring that out now. Uh, uh, I don't know. And, but, but yeah, I mean, my view is like it, I, kind of unfortunately, it's a little bit dangerous to put all of your um, effort into one type of thing because just the, the you know, it's not just that the internet changes quickly anymore too it's like we've seen this i know a lot of cartoonists are upset that like instagram wants you to post videos now because you know like cartoonists are awkward anti-social loners and and now it's like no we, you've got to post reels with your opinions on things and so right. i don't know it, it's tough so the more you can be doing different stuff the more hope you have that like one thing can be your life raft if something else uh, doesn't that's a good. That's a good point. I have to say, I, 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 it wouldn't surprise me if some of our our guests here have never heard of RSS. It's that far back in the in the past at this point. Yeah. Um, I know. But, it's it, yeah. It, it was so nice. It was like I mean I, I mean I, and I I don't use it either, but it's, I my, I think a lot of people after Google stopped supporting it, uh, it, it just kind of went away. And I, I you know I don't want to get too conspiratorial, but I assume part of what's going on is you know RSS is hard to like pull data out of people. You know, whereas if it yeah. you know well. Sure we, have a, we, we have an assignment for one of our one of our classes that's three or four classes into the computer science where it, for a long time there was an RSS assignment and students were asking about it going what is this stuff and mm -hmm. there you go but yeah yeah, yeah. So, the internet that's is that's changing that's true have you have you uh, I mean this may not be in the budget but have you thought of, it, do you work with anybody to try to get your stuff out or are you doing it all on your own like to different platforms uh oh well uh, I have worked with other people. I think it's interesting you asked that. So I like I had worked with third parties, and lately I've switched back to doing it myself. Um, basically, because uh, it's, it's two things. One, one just the, there's a kind of like, God, it kind of sucks that you would have to be so corporate with your own content posting it on the internet. You know what I mean? Like that's just kind of a bummer. Like the whole, not the whole point, but a big thing about the internet was that there was supposed to be a kind of like intimacy to it. Um, uh, you know, that you would just post something and someone else would read it and you'd have that connection. So the idea that you're hiring someone because they have to trip the algorithm on your behalf is just kind of like a bummer. Uh, <laughs> but also um, it's been my experience and it, it, you know, it probably just depends on what you're doing. That for my work, 
I actually, I, and I can, I can, the, the, the analytics is very clear on this. Like I, I, I like, I just, for Facebook, for when, when COVID hit, I just didn't have a lot of time because, uh, because I lost childcare, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was home school. Uh, I, I became a math teacher very quickly. And uh, so I was, I was, I was having to teach my kids all the time, which is cute and all, but like it was tough for business. And um, so I turned it over to a third party and I can see in the analytics, I took it back over like a month ago and like stats, it's like literally a 10 X increase in like across the board, Wow. Uh, which I, yeah, which is like frustrating. Cause it's like, I would like to, I mean, again, like I said, I, you, what I worry about is like all this different social media stuff, all artists are required to do it. Like, I mean, basically what's happened with me is a certain amount of time, which I might've spent reading a book or, uh, or making more content uh, is is now like figuring out well what would what would get me through to my own audience on Facebook, uh, but but like you know like it's a very stark difference to have me running it versus someone else. Uh, so that, that, that's where I'm at now is I, I basically just run it myself and um, and uh, try to keep it personal and kind of small. I would say also you know it's one of these things where I, I I've had points in my career where there's like a crossroads where you say to yourself like I could. I could become a guy who hires three people and we make more money and the money goes to paying for them to be here. And slowly I move from being a cartoonist to being a person who manages this little business. And like, so like Jim Davis, who runs, or I shouldn't say, I guess I should say run, runs like Garfield Enterprises or whatever it's called. I think he's a billionaire. Um, but like, I, you know, I wouldn't mind being a billionaire, but like he doesn't make comics. He's, he's a guy who runs a business based on a, a Garfield you know, franchise uh, or selling Garfield licenses. And like, you know, that's fine and whatever, but it's not for me. Uh, yeah. And so like you say to yourself, like I have this path I could take and I'd rather take the one that leads to me kind of just getting to control everything. And, and uh, even if it's less lucrative. I have to say that's that's heartening, uh, Zach, in a, <laughs> in a lot of ways to, to know that you're you really are in it for, I wanna do what I wanna do, you know, and, and I agree. I agree. The the billionaire aspect is probably tempting, but from the standpoint of doing daily things that you enjoy, that's uh, that's great. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, you don't you don't you don't you don't do a book like uh, Be Wolf unless you're it. Uh, I mean, you know, in general, I would say pretty much anyone drawing gap graphic novels is not there for money because th there just isn't a lot of money. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm one of the lucky ones. I do pretty well uh, from comics, but like. Graphic novels are extremely labor intensive, and maybe, maybe AI is going to change that. We're, we'll all find out in the next ten years. But um, but they're extremely labor intensive, and so um, you know, I, I don't know anyone who's like cynically gets into graphic novels. <laughs> right, right. Well, cool. Well, listen, Zach, we have a we have a whole bunch of people here who I'm guarantee you want to ask some questions. Um, Christian, did you have any particular way you wanted to ask questions? I was planning on just having people raise their hands and then I'll call on them. Does that sound good? That sounds great. All right. All right. What kind of question? And I, I also see at least one or two other aspiring comics out there, comic uh, uh, writers out here too. Um, do, who has a question for for Zach? Just ra do their little raise your hand or put your video on or or what have you. Yes, Estefania. Go ahead. Estefania. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me because I'm you in can. UGR and the by is a little bit spotty perfect um but I saw that you worked on the open borders comics sort of the science and ethics of and I was wondering if you could talk about sort of the role that humor and comics play in educating people about issues like immigration from both scientific sure yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um so uh let's see how to say so so uh, let me separate comics from humor because those are kind of two different things um so like comics i think are a really underappreciated medium uh for this sort of thing i mean it's a little tough because in the u.s and this is my experience in the u.s you get a lot of people who will be like comics are for children um but i think that's not true for people under the age of maybe like 25 or 30 anymore comics are like so so like if you go to france or if you go to japan or if you go to italy or belgium and a lot of other places, uh, comics are just like one more way to do things. In the U.S., they, they for, for historical reasons that I could get into, but but maybe they're not of interest. They're they're a kind of children's medium. And so the one downside is like we would get articles that would like be like you know disagreeing with us and would would cite that it was a cartoon. So you see, it's a childish, stupid people viewpoint, uh, which just wouldn't fly in France, you know. And um, but what I the way I think about it is, I'll tell you this: like so I. 
Uh, I wrote a book called Soonish. It's a 100,000 word popular science book. I'm fairly convinced that a decent percent of all buyers did not read it cover to cover because few, very few people do with prose books. I think that's, that's just the state of the universe. With comic books, I think they do. They pick them up and they read them. I, I think partially that's because it's a shorter format. So I think of as a, a typical graphic novel is 200 to 300 pages, which is about the equivalent of a two hour lecture. And most people have the attention span for a two hour lecture. And then when you add that they're like pictures and faces and emotions, um, for whatever reason, it's just easier for people to, 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 to consume. It's, it's a nice consumable format. The, 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 I, I will say there is a downside to like, you know, in a two hour lecture, you cannot give as much information as you would in eight hours, but I think maybe more information gets through to the reader that they'll retain. So I, you know, it's complicated. And then, but of course you can always be like, look, if you want more information, there, there's Google Scholar. Uh, most people don't, don't do that, but the people who want to can get it. Um, in terms of humor uh, as, as a vehicle, I, I really think, I mean, I don't know for sure, but but like humor is a really good way to to disarm people a little bit, and uh, I think probably that's just because we're all just social apes, and if you can make someone laugh, they feel a little good, and they don't think of you as like, you know, some sort of like crazy alien brain to them. You're you know, and so I think it can it can help to to do that because it's just sort of like. You know, so my view is with most people, part of why people end up really being mad at each other is they don't have to work together. Like if people meet in person, it's very hard to hate each other. You can do it, but it makes life very uncomfortable. Um, and, but you know, I, you know, I can't, I can't do that with 50,000 people uh, like you can reach with, with a comic book. But humor is kind of maybe the closest art form you can get to, to just sort of spending a minute with a person. Um, and so I, I do think there's some value there. Also, just kind of like as a pragmatic matter, I think it, it helps people keep turning pages. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I, I do think it's an underappreciated media. We actually repeatedly with that book by, like, by American writers were credited with like inventing the idea of nonfiction graphic novels, which is like hilarious. Like there was a, there was a in the early 60s, there was a nonfiction graphic novel about Martin Luther King that was used by the um, civil rights movement. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, you might get made fun of by uh, certain elements of the intelligentsia, but you will reach a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a really good direction to go. Yeah, I think you'd read, you're going to reach a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise read yeah. a book, let's say. Yeah. Uh, Estefania, is that, uh, did I answer your question right? Great. Perfect. All right. Who Thank else you, has sir. a question? Yeah. Oh, who else has a question for, uh, for Zach. AC, go ahead. And before AC talks, uh, AC was one of the people I'm, I, I noticed. Uh, AC has an incredible uh, uh, graphical book out about computer science that uh, hopefully we're, we're uh, hopefully she'll get to uh, get out to the masses soon. But go ahead, yeah. AC. Not to steal your thunder, AC, but. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Hey, everybody. Hi, Zach, Christian, Hector, yeah. and Crystal. Um, I was just curious, what does kind of a day to day like work day look like and what keeps you inspired and like the source of inspiration flowing when you do have to make yeah. a comic that's like on a regular basis? So I will tell you, I, I think I quit doing comics like six times before I got locked in and I'll tell you what helped and what I do now, which which works reasonably well. Um, so I, what really helps out is needing to do comics to make a living. It, it, like it, it, there was a point in my twenties where I was like, I can, I can quote unquote make a living, which meant like you know eating noodles every day. But it was you know whatever, like you, know, you make comics, and, and plus when you're twenty and you eat noodles every day, your body still functions, uh, which is which is less true now for me. Um, but so uh, it, it does help to kind of need to do it. I know that's just like, I worry that sounds kind of hallmarky, but like. You know, if, if you have an off ramp, that can be a little dangerous uh, because because it, it is really hard. Uh, my experience is most people. I mean, you don't you don't I, I don't I don't know what your ambitions are, but like so like I do daily comic strips, which is fairly intensive. And most people, when they try to do that, will stop around six weeks or so. If they make it that far, and I think what's going on is if you start writing you know, you, you you basically start using up every joke you've ever had, every anecdote in your life, everything you've ever learned. And it turns out for most of us, including myself, that's not as much as you might guess. Uh, and so you, you just kind of hit a wall. And so what I do now, which is a little zany, I actually have a kind of life schedule. And so um, there are different ways to do that. And I, I, I think it probably pays to experiment because what you're essentially doing is optimizing your brain's output. Um, 
And so I, I tried, for example, like doing like a Ben Franklin schedule every 15 minutes of your life. And that just did not work well for me because it was like, like you're really productive on schedule. But then if you get a phone call for an hour, like at least for me, I was like, oh my God, I'm off schedule and I'm going crazy. And so what I do is I have a list um, in, in just like Google spreadsheet, which is like, here are the 30 tasks today. And it's like very, very specific down to like brush your teeth and uh, you know, feed the dog. Uh, but then it's also like read this much. Um, and so that, that I, I know for, for some people, I think that would be kind of soul crushing um, to be like, you have to read 50 pages a day or, or whatever it is. But for me, it's like, it's really important because I've found if I don't meet my like reading quota that I just, it's like the well runs dry and then I, I'm in a really bad position. So what, what I would do um, if I were like uh, uh, early in my career, and this is what I did do is just like experiment with ways to organize yourself and you'll find how your own brain works. Uh, and, and I like, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I worry like young artists, that sounds kind of like brutal, but it's just kind of like, you know, part of that is being happy, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, so like, like if you're, if you're completely miserable all the time, you also won't be productive and creative and all that nice stuff. Um, the, the one other tip I have is uh, that, that again, just works for me. It might not work for somebody else. Um, like in general, if you're entertaining the public and if you're, if you're already doing computer science, you're ahead of the game, but like you have to bring something to the table that a random person doesn't. Uh, and that can be, you know, like if you're somebody who went to Antarctica uh, and got lost or something, you have a great story, or, you know, I, or you climbed Mount Everest. I don't know. I don't like to leave the house. So what I do is I read more than other people. And that's, that's what I have going for me. And so to that point, what I do try to do is read stuff that maybe sounds boring to me or maybe sounds outside my wheelhouse or, or just stuff that's challenging. Um, and I find that's very helpful. It's almost like if you do like math that you're bad at, being creative is like a relief. Uh, <laughs> so that, that is my collection of tips I've, I've built up over 20 years. Um, uh, in, in terms of what my day looks like, usually what my day looks like is I get up and, and this goes back to the, like the make sure you're watching after your happiness. But in addition to reading, like I, I have chickens I go feed and I, uh, I, I make sure I'm exercising every day. Uh, and then I, I have time set aside to make sure I'm reading a lot. So most of my time is is reading. Um, and, and, and there's some min maxing you can do there, too, which is like, am I better off reading for 45 minutes and writing for 15 a lot of artists will tell you, you know, you've got to stare at a blank page. And I have found that's almost always a mistake. It's just kind of like horrible. Uh, like I, like you, you get good at like, I'm obviously not creative right now. So instead I'm going to go read a book or I'm going to take a walk or I'm going to do something. And when I come back, I'll feel better. But the, but the key is just learning how your brain works and, and trying to make it do the things you want it to do. Hopefully that was helpful, not too rambling. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Zach. Is that, that good, AC? Follow-ups? Great. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Zach, uh, it's it's probably pretty clear to everyone you're pretty organized when it comes down to, it. Oh, and and maybe that's maybe that's uh, you're you're pulling the wool over our eyes, but organization is probably key to a lot of uh, a lot of this. Yeah. yeah un unfortunately, I would say I'm not a naturally organized person. I'd be very clear about that. I'm not like my wife is a like she 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 wants her life organized down to the like millisecond and that that makes her happy it does not make me happy to schedule my life but but like when i don't i get very adrift um so so i i learned to do it as a sort of survival thing or or at least a career survival thing there you go yeah absolutely uh, so like uh i have this i have this idea for a really horrible bad think piece that i probably don't even agree with which is like, there's, there's a lot of focus now on sort of seeking mindfulness and, uh, and all this, like, you know, f finding your, your inner peace and all that stuff. And being an artist is kind of like the opposite path. It's like, I'm, I'm going to like utterly just immiserate and destroy myself, but I'm going to, because I have to make the, this thing. Um, so like, I, I've actually, I've been, uh, the, the, you know, I, I don't want to get too mushy about it, but like, like the fact that Beowulf, which is like, I mean, it's kind of stupid, but it's it's a 600 line poem in a form nobody does anymore. And it's just gotten this extraordinarily positive response. And I've like talked to families that play games with their kids about it and, and wanted to read more epic verse. I was told one child was crying because there was no sequel yet. And that for me is very moving. Um, and, but, but, but to be clear, the actual process of writing it 
was very difficult. Uh, and it was, you know, it was very time consuming and extremely stressful and involved saying no to a lot of fun stuff I would have rather been doing. I mean, I, I don't want to act like it was complete misery all the time. And there, there are genuine moments of like enjoyment. And I, I, I ended up meeting really cool people uh, like, like weird medievalists uh, and, and stuff. Um, but the path is there. The path was, I want to make the perfect thing and I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice some level of well-being in pursuit of it. Um, and uh, I, got, <laughs> I feel like this is like bad advice to give to young people, but there is something to be said for like giving yourself, like, forgetting about like, like there is a, forget, forget about this personal transcendence business and just focus on making the great thing. Um, I don't know. I, I, I really, I find that this feels very old fashioned now, but I really, I am more jealous of like a perfect turn of phrase by, you know, Keats than I am of like Elon Musk's entire career. Uh, because, and I'm, I'm madly jealous all the time, I should say, uh, as, as the proper posture of an artist is, is constant jealousy and anger. Um, but, but I don't know, there's, there's something, I, I'm not a, like a theological person about it, but like, there's just something very special about putting something, like putting a perfect sentence or paragraph into the universe. Um, and, and now and then you get someone who can do it repeatedly. And it's just like the other, I was reading, um, Jorge Luis Borges is, um, collected essays and and you know it's not all good when you do the complete set it's not all going to be good but there's so much that's just astonishing um and to have made such a thing like i would take a high level of life to have that have have been the one to have made that book um so <laughs> it's my, my my like not quite uplifting giving yourself enough credit either i mean you know you talk about how much how prolific some of these other people are yeah. How many comics are you up to now? Daily strip? Oh God! Many, uh, I mean, it's thousands and thousands, correct? Yeah, I, I guess it, I, 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 I know a lot of people obsess over this. I think it's probably somewhere between four and five thousand, but I don't know um, how many. But but I would say even then, you know, that's very nice of you to say. But I would say the, the stuff. What I'm proud of is maybe about a hundred of them. Like there's about a hundred where I'm like, I think this was really good, and I don't know if someone else could have done it. Um, those I feel really good about. Um, the, the the quantity uh, is is nice as a career thing, but it's the the occasional good ones that make you feel really nice. I don't know, a hundred's pretty good. That's uh, yeah. that's 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 pretty good. I wouldn't wouldn't be complaining about that. Uh, <laughs> Jenny, good to see you, Jenny. Jenny, what what uh, what's on your mind? Hi Zach. Hi Kristen. Hi Christian. Um, Zach, I think you briefly touched on this earlier, but what are your thoughts on generative AI and how it might affect a creative process for better or for worse? Yeah, that's a, that's the big question right now. Um, I can tell you uh, anecdotally the feeling in the field, meaning like cartoonists, um, the people I know and interact with, uh, is there is a lot of anger, and I had thought there would just be a lot of fear, and maybe the you know the, it is fear expressing itself as anger, but there is there's a there's a high level of resentment. And I think a lot of it centers on the idea that there are people who are going to be able to do. You know, the, the thing that's a little scary is, is that you could take somebody's style and just duplicate it and take it, and it's not clear what IP protection they'd have. That that seems very legit to me. The the the, the surprising thing is there are a lot of people who are angry angry about the idea that um that there will be people who didn't go through the like time it takes to become good at your craft who can just kind of leapfrog. Um, so on uh, on the second question, I think that's just silly. That's like that's, this is just this is just the way things are, and I think it's. Whatever it does to my career, it's a better world if 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 people can jump straight to making really good art uh, without having to go through as much craft. And it's it's like kind of a bogus complaint too, because there was a very similar complaint when digital stuff came out in general uh, that people weren't having to learn to like you know use. I, I mean, I I started my career doing pencil and ink and like scanners and stuff. That's how it used to be, and and, and that was even you know that was a digital scanner. That was an evolution on the old system. So like I I, I don't think that's a legitimate complaint or it's. it's it's a legitimate complaint about your own life, but it's not a legitimate complaint about the sort of economics of it. But the, I think the question of IP is the hard one. So like, um, what I think is scary is, so like, I'm an okay artist, but I'm more known for writing. So I think I, I have a little bit of protection. Like by the time people are like, a computer can do the, the high level work I do, we're all, we're all just losing. Um, but like, I know a lot of people who are like, they're, they're fine writers, but they're known for just exquisite artwork. And I worry, I obviously worry about them, but I also worry that the economics is gonna be bad, which is to say, you know, you know, it'll be very easy to, to create a whole life's corpus, but then where are you going to get people doing new stuff um, that, that, that takes 10 years to get to? I don't know. Um, 
but my my suspicion you know this came up i was talking to my daughter who's eight and she is very she, you know like maybe this is just every eight-year-old but she was like well i want to be an artist and i i did kind of notice i was hesitating i was like kind of like i don't know kid you know by the time you're you know an artist you know like where you artists maybe you're a professional by like if you worked hard by like 20 or 22 or 25 I don't know what that career is going to look like. I don't know if that's even a career anymore as such. Um, so, I mean, the big answer to your question is I don't know. And I think there's a lot of fear. There, there's a big, you know, this is kind of inside baseball, but like a very common piece of software is Clip Studio. They introduced AI features and there was so much rage that they actually took it out. They removed a feature just to not anger people. Um, but my suspicion is what's going to happen is that there are going to be people who adapt to AI and they'll be able to produce two to three times, maybe more as much content and they'll just win, like just economically. And so everyone's going to have to adapt. A, a, a vaguely similar thing happened with the move to digital. Um, uh, could, because like, like, so in my case, I'm positive going to digital made me draw two to three times faster. AI might be, you know, five to 10 times faster. And so I think, you know, regardless of what's good or right, the, I think the economics is going to lead to people who are willing to embrace AI winning. And I, I don't know what that means for the art form though. I, 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 I feel very ambivalent about it. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question? I'm happy to do a follow up. Uh, it's, it's a strange- Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it's really refreshing to hear from an artist instead of all the computer scientists on Twitter talking about it. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm a weird person here because like I know a lot of artists who are just like, no, we hate these people. And like, I don't know, I have a lot of friends who are like computer science people, like I have friends with people who work at NVIDIA on this exact sort of stuff. And I don't know, it's, I think if you went back 20 years and you said to someone, hey, imagine you could just imagine a movie and make it and you didn't have to hire all these people and have all these money, I think most people would see that as positive. But it, it is so disruptive right now. Um, uh, and I, I think part of what's scary and I think this is probably an, an omnipresent issue in AI is, is it's like, what worries me is I think people, and it, maybe maybe I'm just flattering myself and I'm gonna get messed over too, but like people like me who work at a fairly high level uh, are maybe okay. But like, there are a lot of people who are just kind of like laborers. I mean, that's a weird way to put it, but they're like, like who draw like manga, like that's not high level creative work uh, compared to um, what some other people do. It's, 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 it's like, you know, there's definitely creative work that goes into it, but there's a lot of stuff where it's just like a director of the comic tells you, draw this angle, draw this person, draw this stuff. That's very easy for an AI to do now. And so I think that's that's the people who, I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, so, so that is scary. So I'm, I'm, I'm torn between like the, the sort of like fascinating open vista and the, the you know, potential devastation to a lot of very interesting people. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the insight on that, uh, Zach. Could you give us thirty seconds on what your current tools are as far as uh, as far as drawing? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm fairly boring. I I use a Cintiq Wacom tablet. It's actually about like a ten year old one at this point. Um, I work exclusively digital now and have for ten years. Um, and I, I, to be honest, my work is so simple. I really don't use a lot of like stuff. I mean, I download like brushes and that sort of thing. I, for 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 B Wolf, it, 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 this is kind of fascinating. You look at it, you would swear it's drawn in like charcoal, but it's all digital. It was done in Procreate. Um, but but Gilles uh, the Boulet, the the artist, um, he's like a master of this stuff. And so like uh, I, I, digital is just completely wanted that. And 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 that guy, kind of gets into this AI stuff real quick, which is like you used to be if you wanted to do cross hatching, you had to do this all day, and now there's a brush for it. And I think that's basically good, but it is it is a little strange. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. Well, listen, uh, Zach, we are we are at the end of our our amazing talk with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, I, I, I'm telling you, I am more jealous about a turn of phrase in Keats than <laughs> my entire career is uh, going on my wall. I think with your uh, <laughs> thing that right next to it. Um, but, uh, but thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I, if uh, if everyone can can applaud, etc., for for Zach, thank you for joining us. Um, Christian, is there anything else you need uh, from from us, or uh, we? Uh, good. Uh, no, I, I I would also like to thank you, Zach, uh, like Chris, for like um, doing this conversation, and everyone who came here. Like, thank you so much for joining us today in this meeting, and for joining us in general, like in our um, computer science edition in this group. So thank you so much.
Yeah, thank you so much, Zach. And and please keep keep doing uh, keep doing the things you love, because we thank, all love thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And if, if if anybody has any questions, I, my my public email is actual me. So I'm, I'm always happy to talk to a young cartoonist trying to figure out what to do. Great. Great, cool. Thank you very much, Zach. And thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Uh, this, was a, this was a lot of fun.